You're watching Beyond Markets. Welcome, I'm Kenneth Ibomo, and on today's show, we'll explore how Nigeria can move the needle for food security. You can join the conversation with the hashtag Beyond Markets, and you can also follow my handle at Kenneth Ibomo. Now, Africa's most populous country, Nigeria, has an estimated 201 million mouths to feed daily, according to recent data from the United Nations Population Fund. Ensuring food security for this rising population is no easy feat. And I have with me Kola Masha, he's the managing director of Babangona, and he joins me to explore how Nigeria can move the needle for food security. Well, I think uh, if you look at uh, Nigeria's ability to keep up with a growing population in terms of domestic production, we've actually done relatively well. Um, however, if you actually dissect the numbers and you look at you know, where that growth is coming from, a significant portion of that growth has come from expanding the area under cultivation versus trying to intensify and increase productivity per square, uh, per hectare. And, um, and so I think it's served us okay uh, but the reality is unless we start really focusing on increasing the productivity on a per hectare basis, at some point we're going to run out of land and we're going to have a much bigger problem. But even when you talk about land, you know, there are even challenges with people getting land specifically for agri agriculture. You know, how easy it is for someone who wants to venture into agriculture to say, okay, you know, I'm trying to get into food processing or I'm trying to get into crop production or, or forestry or maybe other aspects of agriculture to get the kind of land that they need. Well, I think the reality is that uh, in Nigeria, we think we have a lot of land. i have got about 84 million hectares of arable land. If you put that on a per capita basis, it's about half a hectare per person. Right. If you look at it on a per capita basis per rural inhabitant, today it's about 0 0.9 hectares per person. So the reality is we actually don't have a lot of land. Um, so, so that's one of the key challenges of, uh, of, of going down a path of large scale uh, agriculture. Now the reality is many other countries in the world uh, face a similar challenge, mostly in Southeast Asia. And those countries have had a very successful uh, uh, agriculture sector that's been built on farmers that typically have about three hectares worth of land. And those three hectare farmers can be very commercial, very profitable, and uh, those sectors can be, uh, if you look at Thailand as an example, or Vietnam, they're just dominant uh, in the global agricultural space. All right, but one other issue I would like to bring up here is also the access to inputs because mm -hmm. when you look at, we have quite a large number of smallholder farmers. I know you, quite a, you deal with quite a lot of them. Mm -hmm. but I'm trying to imagine the kind of challenges they have with accessing the right inputs mm -hmm. when you talk about from seedlings to fertilizers to even um, get the kind of um, machines or, you know, mm -hmm. agri agri machine, uh, machines they need for, to drive their, uh, their growth. Well, it is a very critical challenge. I think as a smallholder farmer in Nigeria, you struggle to access the technology you need to really optimize uh, your, your returns. And I think I'll focus in particularly on the example of seed, right? Um, at the end of the day, your, your yield as a farmer is capped by the genetic potential of that seed you're planting. And if you look at the seed sector in Nigeria, it is really, really, uh, uh, there's not a lot of innovation that comes in. Um, you know, you've got a scenario where in, uh, in our neighbors and to, in East Africa, they're releasing 15, 20 new varieties every year. Uh, take for example for maize, if you go down to South Africa, they're releasing dozens of varieties every year. Nigeria commercially released new varieties, you know, we're lucky if we get two or three. Uh, every year, and so there's so uh, it's like uh, you know if you're in the tech business and you uh, you uh, you're getting uh, you know one new phone every year, so. Uh -huh. Okay, but when you look at that, you know, getting this you know, improved seedlings, mm -hmm. you know, and all that, requires quite a lot, lot of research coming mm -hmm. from in country, you know. And but I see we try also try to do some with some things with the uh, in GMO um, mm -hmm. foods. I see we did quite a lot with cowpea, mm -hmm. soybeans. We signed uh, some permits with some com com companies who are going to be trying to get that com commercial in there. What would you say is the rate of adoption to some of this? Because some of the farmers still don't believe in GMO. Well, I think the uh, uh, you know GMO is is a uh, is uh, something that I think the world is coming to terms with. I think there's been a lot of uh, um, resistance over the decades, particularly from Europe. Uh, but if you actually look at Europe today, uh, the rate of adoption of GMO technology in Europe is quite significant. Uh, I think there have been studies done uh, over the last several decades that have demonstrated that really there is actually no actual evidence that there's a, there are real challenges. I think it's just uh, uh, concerns and fears over new types of technology. But the reality, many of the technologies we're talking about are not actually GMO technologies. These are just new improved varieties, and, um, and, and, and um, particularly uh, hybrid varieties which are uh, basically kind of a cross between two, uh, two uh, a male and female of the same type of species. So the, uh, the reality is 
uh, what we the challenge we face in Nigeria is actually more of a policy uh, issue uh, with regards to the government being open to uh, new technology coming in and being commercialized without actually having to be produced domestically. As you talked about research and development, it's kind of like almost like the pharmaceutical industry, right? So you, there's been a lot of investment in technology in other parts of the world that have similar uh, agroecological conditions as uh, Nigeria. What the government needs to encourage is for folks who have those varieties to be able to import them, allow them to be uh, tested at a commercial scale, and once they take hold, people will start to invest in supply chains to produce them locally. But today, the government requires that for companies to do that, they must actually, from day one, start producing the technology in country. The analogy I use is like if, uh, if they had required MTN when they, joined, when they came into Nigeria, that the tower technology had to be produced in Nigeria from day one. All right, so it means um, more or less uh, more education, or, or you mean you should engage with the, the regulators more? Mm -hmm just so that they understand that the issues are you know, somewhat different. And it's a fundamental issue. I think the reality is we are not going to get increased productivity in this country unless farmers have access to the seed technology that can give them that increase. Without that, we're really uh, limited. But I'm, I'm concerned though, what, what, would, what would you say was the valid concern of the, of the, of the, for the regulators or the ministry in putting this, this into this law? Well, I think, um, you know, I speculate here, but um, uh, what I would uh, suspect is that they, they're trying to protect the local seed production industry, right? Because if they allow companies to basically come into Nigeria and import seeds ready to be used by farmers, the domestic seed production industry uh, may suffer. But at the end of the day, you're protecting a relatively small part of the, of the economy at the disadvantage of 23% of the economy. All right, but still of the policies, though, when you look at how the government has been trying to, you know, get more agri-exports from our, gro 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 our crops and also mm -hmm. improve self-sufficiency in some of the main staples, mm -hmm. how would you say we have fared? Well, I think um, there's uh, been a very focused effort on rice, uh, which I think we have started to see some of the dividends on. But once again, that focus has been mostly on the downstream part of the value chain. There's been a massive effort to help increase the production capacity for mills in country, which has grown dramatically in the last few years. Um, however, very quickly, those mills are going to run into a supply constraint because yields are stagnating right on the rice side. And those yields are not really going to move until really uh, three things happen. One, you get improved varieties for the farmers, higher yielding seed varieties, uh, particularly hybrid rice varieties. Um, two, uh, farmers have access to the credit to be able to buy these higher, uh, these higher costs but hi higher value uh, inputs. And three, strong supply chains that enable them to access the other critical services that they need. All right, but another major issue that we kind of face with agriculture here is storage. Mm -hmm. You know, and then we, we see what the amount of the numbers from post-harvest losses are, mm -hmm. you know, are staggering. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when you look at it, you know, how would you, you know, encourage, you know, you know, the, the ministry or, you know, or players in agriculture to, to attack this specific bit when it comes to storage or how can we emulate what other people are doing in other climes? Well, I think storage, don't get me wrong, I think it, it, is, a, it is a challenge, um, but I think twofold. One, uh, if you actually, uh, if, it, uh, if it's a problem you want to, to tackle, right, you know, you've got two problems, right? If you have a business, do you want to try to ensure that you protect that business so that you lose, maybe instead of losing 25%, you lose maybe 12%, or do you want to focus on that business so that you are able to, instead of producing $1, you're able to produce $2, right? You all want to focus on the things that are going to grow, which is really around the yield and productivity. But if you do focus on the, on the storage side and protecting from against losses, uh, if you actually dig into the numbers and look at Nigeria relative to other parts of the world, right? The reality is agriculture is dealing with perishable commodities. You will see losses just by its nature. And so, uh, yes, our losses tend to be slightly higher, but they're not dramatically higher than in many other parts of the world. But I think this speaks to value addition, mm -hmm. because if we have these raw, 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 raw materials, raw, raw crops, mm -hmm. and then we do some level of um, um, value addition from the source where it's being planted, Correct. to some large extent, that would go about to reduce some of the post harvest losses. 100% agreed. And I think there is definitely an opportunity around uh, government looking at opportunities around stimulating um, 
small scale processing for, for target, targeted types of uh, commodities. And I think that will, in rural communities, and I think that will actually help to stimulate and strengthen some of these rural communities and actually, uh, in a sense, create an economic buffer that will help to spread, to curb some of the insecurity that we're seeing in these areas. All right, but when you look at areas around, you know, our export strategy and how we're trying to get this, because, you know, it's all linked from getting the raw materials to adding value and then exporting exporting mm -hmm. the, the crops. What you know, When you look at the entire you know, food chain, where would you say Nigeria is lagging behind the most? Um, fundamentally, it's really at the, it's the, uh, it's the m middle of that chain. So from my perspective, I look at the chain in three buckets. You've got the, uh, you've got the input supply chain, you've got the production, and then you've got the post-harvest, uh, say, marketing, storage marketing and, product and uh, processing. That middle part of the chain is where things are broken. And a lot of focus needs to uh, be put on that piece because once that middle piece gets strengthened, the private sector will react, right? One, uh, once you've got a strong production sector, the input companies will now, you know, want to service that market, right? Once you've got a strong production uh, system, the people will invest in processing to start to utilize some of those, uh, some of those produce. Take, for example, maize, right? Maize is used in 27,000 different products in the world today. In Nigeria, we're lucky if we're using them for five. Very interesting because yes, because I look at that and I look at you know some of the biggest you know um, you know meals in 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 the world and I look at how they they get into you know producing products that are more not not necessarily the raw maize that you eat mm -hmm. but basically that they sh that kind of improves the shelf life of mm -hmm. the product and I rarely see many of such companies in Nigeria. Yep, very true, and I think it's, it stems from the fact that that, that uh, production side is, is, is struggling. I think it's one of the reasons why, for our, from our standpoint, that's an area that we've really focused on and been able to enable small farmers to get yields that are equivalent to farmers in China, yields to farmers in Brazil, so on and so forth. Yeah, but I would see, I would see part of why we're not industrializing so much within with most of these products is the fact that it's linked to some of the challenges we have you know, in country. Power, for example, mm -hmm. we, we see how much power we generate in there, and the industries are not getting this much. So, I think for me, I think maybe probably that's one of the reasons why we're not seeing that much in there. I'd, I'd like to get your thoughts on that. Well, I think power power is a critical piece, right? Uh, but I think from my perspective, from talking to a lot of uh, you know, we you know today we're the single largest producer of maize in Nigeria, so we sell to a lot of industries and and understand their challenges. And power is it's painful to pay that diesel bill at the end of the month. Yeah. Um, but I think the reality is that um, uh, if they got consistent power all day long, it may they would still have significant other challenges. And one of the reasons I, I I'll give an example of you know if you take a uh, trip across the border to our neighbor, yeah. they have a lot more consistent power than us. Yeah. But their economies still have significant challenges as well. So I think okay. power, don't get me wrong, is important, uh, but as it goes to agriculture, fixing that uh, farm level productivity, hands down, the number one thing to focus on. I've been speaking to Kola Masha, he's the managing director of Babangona. You're just joining us, Kola Masha, the managing director of Babangona, is with me today, and we're discussing ways to improve food security in Nigeria. Earlier, we were talking about maize, and I just wanted to ask a very interesting question. It's a key staple in, in Nigeria. We love this, this crop so much. But how come we still don't have that all year round? Well, I think um, so. Uh, maize is, uh, is a crop that does require a fair amount of water. So irrigating it uh, uh, would be somewhat expensive. Now, if we were, say, uh, sitting in a country where the government had invested and effectively subsidized massive irrigation, gravity-fed irrigation schemes, which, are, which is the most inexpensive way to, uh, to irrigate, um, I think we, would be, we have a situation where you'd be able to get uh, maize in the off-season uh, that is at a price that would not be prohibitive for the, for the average consumer. All right, because I'm looking at we're subsidizing fuel. You know, and this is a key staple. And Nigerians really love their maize. Yeah. You know. Okay, but let's let's get into other things. You know, flooding has been a you know major issue. You know, in the country, we've seen that kind of be recall in the, over the years. Last Very year, so just over twenty states affected by flooding in there. You know, but when you look into the year, how come we're not being more responsive to some of these challenges? Well, I think uh, you know the flooding situation is an unfortunate uh, outcrop of, uh, of of climate change. Uh, the sad reality is that, despite the fact that Sub-Saharan Africa did not really contribute to the climate change challenge, 
uh, we are going to bear the brunt of it uh, because we, when you see the climactic changes that are coming from that, most of it would be impacted within Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, so I think the reality is that we need to start getting very serious about thinking about ways to, one, make farmers more resilient to climate change, meaning that they are able to have the technology or capabilities to re, to that the impact of this variation weather will be less so, and then as well as opportunities to enable them to access uh, insurance products and things like that that can help them really uh, bounce back from these challenges. All right, then. still moving on from climate, though, we've seen other human, you know, induced ca catastrophes with agri. We've seen the, you know, where court conflicts, you know, have done to, you know, mm -hmm. food production in some states. Mm -hmm. You know, we still talking about the headsman crisis, although it's been mm -hmm. kind of reduced for now. Yep. But when you look at how we've managed some of these conflicts mm -hmm. and securities, um, secu sec insecurity issues, mm -hmm. you know, do you think we're, we're, we're doing for the better now? Well, um you know, insecurity, hands down, I think is the is the greatest risk facing uh, us as a nation today. Um, I think we we need to recognize that there is no magic border, right? Insecurity will continue to spread unless something very urgent and important is done. And I think fundamentally, agriculture actually bear, holds the key to that problem. Really, at the end of the day, why do these insecurity? Why, why does insecurity spread? Right? You, it, it's based on the fact that you've got these insurgencies and these groups that uh, that it's find it relatively easy to find disaffected young people to join them. Right. So, if you are able to provide those disaffected young people an alternative economic opportunity, I think you will, in effect, uh, you know, as we often say, uh, you will drain the oxygen uh, from the fire. And so, uh, I think agriculture really. Uh, holds a key for that, uh, but there needs to be a very, very focused effort to enable smallholder farmers in these rural communities that are at risk for the spread of insecurity to dramatically improve their profitability. But when you look at how much the government is trying to be self-sufficient in, in food, for example, you know, but we still have these porous borders mm. in there. You know, you know, is it, is it too much to call for stricter border border control? Well, I think you know. You know, we have, to, we have to recognize Nigeria has a very, very large land border. Um, and I think to effectively patrol our land border uh, is not a trivial matter by any stretch of the imagination. So I think our approach to this needs to be a little bit more market focused to say, okay, how can we enable our sectors to become productive so that they are, uh, that you do not even, nobody wants to smuggle products in because they are going to be more expensive if you smuggle them in versus what you can produce domestically. So I think that should be a critical focus of the government. All right, but looking at our small, small commodities, though, uh, you're very int interesting you talk about that. I'm looking at partnerships that are going on across the continent now. We're look, talking about the Africa Free, Con uh, Free Trade um, Continental Agreement, mm -hmm. and uh, we're seeing countries are coming on board here. Mm -hmm. Do you think Nigeria being a secret to this, by how much do you think this will have impact our, some of our key crops? Well, I think it's uh, you know Nigeria needs to needs to uh, recognize the dominant position it has in potentially being a major exporter to the region, right? If you look at our northern neighbors, right? If you look at the the the, the countries to our north, if you look at the population there, that's 60 million people, right? That are landlocked, and Nigeria, if we actually take an approach. Uh, more uh, akin to what China does and says, look, how can we invest in infrastructure and different uh, policies that will make us the preferred trade partner with that 60 million person market? And then all overnight, we will be able to have uh, increase the, uh, the market that we serve dramatically. All right, then I'd like to get into the area of um, special economic, special so agro processing zones mm -hmm. and what the government is trying to do be, to be del very deliberate with getting some crops, you mm -hmm. know, to be to reach their maximum in there. Mm -hmm. How would you how would you rate how the government has gone about this so far? Well, I think uh, to date I've seen, a, I think it's a good idea in concept. Um, I've yet to see it fully rolled out. Um, because quite frankly, it's a, it's a little bit of a, it's, it's quite a challenging uh, project. And I think the reality is that the government will need to take that first step because there's a little bit of a chicken and egg issue, right? So if the government doesn't, if somebody goes in and says, I'm going to invest in this, in this, put a plant here and the government says, I'm going to bring infrastructure and you invest your plant and infrastructure never comes, you know. So I think the reality is the government probably needs to really focus on first, let's put our money where our mouth is. Let's invest in that infrastructure and demonstrate to people, yes, this infrastructure is here, and then you'll start to see 
private sector react to that? But we have budgeting limitations. True. Uh, but I think it's all about prioritization. And so at the end of the day, agriculture is 23% of your GDP, employs 70% of your workforce, but gets 4% of the budget. Yeah, but looking at, the, looking at the budget, the country has faced quite a number of challenges in the, we are, you, you mentioned priorities, quite key. But when you look at the contribution of Ivory Creek to the, to, to, to the uh, government over the, over the years, mm -hmm. you know, how strategic do you think we can be in getting the best out of Ivory Creek with what we have so already? Well, I think uh, a very, very focused approach. If resources are limited, just, you know, personally, I would say if your resources are limited, pick three crops that you have a comparative advantage on and focus on fixing the entire value chain for those three crops. And uh, I think what I often see is, uh, is uh, strategies where we take limited resources and we basically spread them across, I think uh, the last strategy I saw, I think they had a 21 crop focus. Right, so I think it's it's we have to be realistic uh, in the in the constraints that we have and the uh, and the challenging problems that we really need to invest in to solve. Yeah, but when you look at the uh, lands, landscape of agriculture in Nigeria, the bulk of the conversation usually tilts towards crop production. But there are other very lucrative parts of you know agriculture in mm -hmm. Nigeria. You know how are we how can we get this search light to be in some of these areas? I think um, you know, it's very true. Um, I think it's it, part of the challenge is, is the nature of funding constraints that we have as a really as a as a as a as a country, right? If you look at say forestry, if you look at uh, some of these livestock plays, they tend to be a little bit more capital intensive uh, than uh, than crop production, which crop production requires a lot of capital, but is more working capital, short term working capital, relatively short term, you know, one year or less working capital. Uh, but you know, you talk about a plantation play, right? If you're investing in an oil plantation, you're talking about you're going to need seven, eight, ten-year capital, right? And that type of capital is very difficult to to, to get domestically. Uh, if you look at uh, investing in some of the uh, livestock plays, aquaculture, um, other uh, poultry, so on and so forth, those businesses have tremendous opportunity. But the reality is also those businesses are very dependent on the crop sector as well. Yeah, but when I look at crops like rubber. You know, which are very important for some certain industries. Mm -hmm. But how much are we being strategic to lure some of the um, factories or the the makers of the final goods to come into the country, so that we we can serve as a base for the raw materials? Well, I think it's it's to be, as you mentioned, it really has not been prioritized, and I think it comes back to the fact that agriculture, that the crop side. If you look, if you if you uh, splice the GDP figures, the crop side is so dominant. Right, uh, we're talking about north of eighty percent. Of contribution, and so, uh, so I think the the government has uh, chosen to to focus on those areas because that's where you're going to get the biggest bang for your buck. Bang buck. Okay. Now let's look at areas around you know our play as a, as a country on the con on the on well, not on the continent alone, but just looking first at West Africa. You know, trying to be that major agri hub for the the sub region. Mm -hmm. You know, how how well have we fed in this on this? Uh, I don't think we fared very well at all. I think it's very, it's very unstructured. Uh, if you look at the, the, the exports that happen today, it's, uh, it's uh, really on the gray market. Um, and you see some policies that are actually counterproductive. Uh, take, for example, uh, on the books today, it uh, tells you that you, it's, it, it's, you, you can't actually export maize, when the reality is Niger, Chad, so on and so forth are perfect markets for uh, for uh, for our maize production, so I think there needs to be a concerted effort to really look at you know what does Nigeria need to do to harness to become the preferred uh, supplier to that 60 million person market in the north, and and once again identify one, two, three commodities that we are going to just focus on uh, supplying to those markets. Let me bring the private sector in here. Because I understand that you, are, you have businesses who have done the same business in other climes, and then they understand the challenges in there. Mm -hmm. Are we seeing more, you know, agri entrepreneurs coming into the country from other countries? Well, I think you've, you've seen some increase. Um, I think, generally speaking, Nigeria does, uh, does uh, quite frankly, scare a few investors. Um, and so uh, I think government has done, I think this government in particular has done a fair amount of effort to try to uh, change that misconception. I think fundamentally as an entrepreneur working in Nigeria for over a decade now, uh, I think you know, there are a lot of benefits uh, and opportunities here, but I think there is a strong misconception that needs to be fixed.
I have been speaking to Kola Masha. He's the managing director of Babangona. And that's it on Beyond Markets for today. And thank you so much for joining us. Remember, you can watch the show at 5 p.m. West Africa time daily and have access to all previous episodes of Beyond Markets on our website at cmbcafrica.com. You can also stay engaged with the hashtag Beyond Markets and follow me at Kenetic Bamo. Have a wonderful day.